And Lorenzo, would you like to introduce yourself yeah. quickly? So thank you, Nadia, uh, and thank you everyone for attending. My name is Lorenzo Melchor. I am a PhD in molecular biology and a master's student in policy analysis. But uh, up to a couple of weeks ago, I have been an uh, EU science advisor and diplomacy officer at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, the uh, And now I have moved to the Joint Research Center at the European Commission. In FACID, I have been heavily involved in S4D4C together with my other colleagues, Ana Lorza and Isaskun Lacunza, who you will get to, to know in the following session. Uh, in the in FACID, we were responsible of three different tasks. Uh, one was uh, the organization of these annual networking meetings. The second one was uh, contributing to policy impact of these meetings in particular, and the wide uh, consortium uh, in general, producing different policy reports. And the third area of work for FACIT in s 4 d has been training scientists and diplomats to work in science diplomacy. To our involvement in training workshops, as well as uh, with the launch and design of the uh, s 4 d European Online Science Diplomacy course that some of you may have already taken. Thank you, Lorenzo. I'm very happy to be here with you guys because now we want to talk about the governance of science and diplomacy. We know that actors and activities um, that are in effect in acting in science diplomacy are very diverse and also its underlying mechanisms are very complex and diverse. And the idea of deploying science diplomacy for greater good and for global challenges uh, shows us clearly that national approaches will not lead far. Uh, but how is it that science diplomacy uh, can operate on this interface or at this interface at different levels with different stakeholders, institutions, etc., etc., and act in a multilateral framework? Especially COVID-19 has made it very clear again, concerted action is very much needed. But how can this be achieved? With these questions in mind, we would like to introduce you to um, the findings of our projects or some of the findings and thinkings. Um, so I would like to pose the first questions to Lorenzo. Lorenzo, one of um, S4D4C's first outputs at the very beginning of the project was the Madrid -like Declaration. Um, it was co composed in late uh, 2018. It has been signed by over 160 individuals from all over the world. And would you like to explain uh, to our audience why the Madrid Declaration links to the question of governance of science diplomacy? Yes, sure, uh, Nadia. Uh, the, science the Madrid Declaration of Science Diplomacy is definitely one of uh, the outputs that we feel the proudest of. Uh, on the one hand, because of its wider support uh, uh, with key opinion leaders endorsing uh, this declaration. And the declaration was uh, conceived as a result of our first networking meeting uh, celebrated in Madrid in December in, uh, in 2018. The declaration moves the importance of science diplomacy as a practice from the national level to the multilateral scene. This is quite important because S4D4C has been focused on science diplomacy for addressing global challenges rather than science diplomacy for addressing national needs. The Madrid Declaration of Science Diplomacy, what it takes is fostering agreement and raising awareness about the need of strengthening science diplomacy strategies and practices worldwide. But we do so uh, with the understanding that we need support universal scientific and democratic values. In that stance, science diplomacy or that science endeavor becomes political, perhaps not partisan, but becomes political at defending universal uh, scientific and democratic values. Also, how we should do that? We, because what we want to do is raising the importance of science, technology, and innovation as a crucial dimension in international affairs at different poli uh, political levels, from the supranational level or the global level to the national or even the subnational level. But in doing so, the, the declaration what it takes is a clear stance in doing it as a co-creation exercise, a multi-stakeholder approach where the scientific community, the diplomatic community and the policymaking community comes all together to design those approaches in an explicit way. Building bridges between the scientific, the technological and the innovation communities with the diplomatic ones is necessary uh, to co-create these strategies. 
learning the mutual interests and uh, see which shared goals can be put in place, not at the expense of each party, but joining interests and goals from both parties. In that regard, uh, the declaration also upholds that science diplomacy is often not fully exploited at all levels of governance. More could be done, and especially at the supranational level, uh, bringing countries together uh, in a multilateral framework. And second, more explicit science diplomacy strategies at national and supranational levels would allow for more effective alignment of interests and more efficient coordination of resources. The declaration delves on different uh, values or benefits and principles to foster this science diplomacy strategy. But as, answering your question, Nadia, the key governance framework for science diplomacy for addressing global challenges is if we embrace multilateralism and bring down silos from public administration departments, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and those ones with the competencies of science, technology and innovation, but also different governance levels. We need to get involved regions and cities also in this discussion and uh, beyond the public administration, we need to strike alliances with the private sector. So uh, that's mostly uh, a summary of the Madrid Declaration, but it's online and everyone could go and even endorse it. I think there is still time. Thank you, Lorenzo. Yes, there's still time to endorse it. Uh, you can see it on the screen here. And I think my colleague, Sophie, posted uh, the link in the chat as well. So. You're welcome to join us in, in, in signing the declaration. Um, but let us look at another aspect of the governance of science diplomacy. Ever within the project, one of the main tasks was uh, to elaborate on the idea of a science governance, science diplomacy governance framework. It, it was one of the work packages that especially you worked on very strongly. And uh, what was the idea and understanding behind it? And how did, did you proceed when working on the topic? Yes, thanks, Nadia. Um, well. I think what, what we did is fortunately, of course, very in line with what Lorenzo was just explaining about the Madrid Declaration. Uh, we had a couple of starting points uh, in our work on, the, on this governance framework. And that was, first of all, and I think that is also what comes to the fore from the literature that, that exists now, is that science diplomacy can be approached in a much more systematic way. Um, uh, and that is partly because there's with some people only a vague idea for what it actually is, it can mean a lot of things. It, uh, it takes a lot of forms. So, um, so a more structured or systematic approach to governing science diplomacy was, um, was very useful, was uh, judged very useful. And second, uh, also as you uh, touched upon in your introductory talk, uh, what we see is that the international governance regime, especially when, when it comes to addressing societal challenges, uh, such as the SDGs, what we see at the United Nations Framework Conference on Climate Change, is often slow and unsatisfactory. Um, and I think, and also Lorenzo touched upon this, is that science diplomacy can really play a role in transcending these national interests and uh, put a more collaborative uh, approach uh, in, uh, as a substitute in place. And I think our approach to governing science diplomacy builds on two aspects broadly. First of all, uh, it is very visible that the diplomatic arena has not been spared by the move from government to governance. So the multilateral uh, approach or the multilateral aspect, we see that NGOs, research institutions, subnational governance actors all play a role in all kinds of interactions, uh, transboundary interactions uh, that uh, also contain uh, scientific uh, issues, scientific problems. Um, and that also means that the processes that we're looking at become more and more complex. Um, at the same time, claims to authority and claims to influence are challenged. So new actors come into the arena that claim an influence in science diplomacy. And um, this is also something we actually tried to cover in the approach that we took through these co-creation workshops that we organized. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is that science diplomacy represents a broad set of activities. Uh, there are nuances, mixtures, processes that are not necessarily labeled as science diplomacy. So these. Uh, these three well-known um, 
kind of science diplomacy activities that were introduced 12 years ago by the Royal Society are much, um, uh, are, well, there are analytical distinctions. In reality, when we look at what's going on there, it's much more uh, diverse, as for example, that our transversal case analysis has also shown. Um, so to come to a kind of conclusion about this governance framework, uh, science diplomacy cannot be organized uh, and governed through blueprints. There are, it is not impossible, given this complexity, to uh, find out blueprints. So we were not able to say, this actor needs to do this or that, uh, so that science diplomacy is successful, um, because this was, would defy the contextual character of the science diplomatic processes. So our conclusion was that this requires a much more abstract look on the practices that make up science diplomacy and not on the actors themselves. And what we came up with are procedural guidelines um, that, uh, that are much more a way of doing science diplomacy or that should guide the way we do science. But when planning an activity, actors need to make sure that everyone look at our governance framework that we also that is also downloadable from the website. You will see that it's an abstract framework, yes, but it's one that does justice to the complexity, diversity, and contextuality of the science diplomacy interactions that we found in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Ivat. Thank you very much. Um, I shared in earlier my screen and you could see, see the slides with the uh, um, ideas of the protocol. I would do that again in order for you to see it um, because it's a very interesting uh, finding that we had there. Um, I would like to um, continue with another question to Lorenzo um, because he said, um, because there was another output of the project also concerning um, this idea of governing the science diplomacy. It is a policy brief called uh, Calling for a Systemic Change. And there, Lorenzo, you and your colleagues um, argued uh, that science diplomacy can only thrive for its maximum if it is embedded into a system um, of interaction between stakeholders and where interaction is facilitated. And would you give us some insights into your finding why, of why is this is so very much important in order to, um, to steer science diplomacy? Thank you, Nadia. And this goes alongside the, the policy outputs uh, Ever has uh, presented. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, based on a co-creation exercise, taking on board insights and interventions from our two networking meetings uh, celebrated in Madrid in 2018, as well as in Berlin in 2019, uh, we also took on board our academic and policy outputs and also our own professional experience to identify a set of stoppers, warnings, warnings and drivers that are either preventing, hindering, or driving science diplomacy for addressing global challenges. These items were identified within each of the systems uh, in, in, in place, the science system, the uh, diplomatic system, and the shared system of science diplomacy. Allow me to emphasize uh, some examples of, of stoppers. For instance, scientific and research misconduct uh, prevents, uh, is a clear stopper for science diplomacy for addressing global challenge, challenges, because it erodes uh, public trust on scientific institutions. Uh, it, it goes deeper into the uh, uh, scientific uh, and research misconduct of the actors operating in science. Uh, another stopper could be the uh, protectionism or nationalism or populism that certain governments have had uh, over the last few years or even with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic management. Uh, that would be a clear stopper, diplomatic stopper, for science diplomacy for addressing global challenges in a multilateral framework. Examples of drivers, on the other hand, is that we've got good science advice mechanisms put in place, like from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change to the United Nations, to the scientific advisory mechanism in the European Union. But also there are also other uh, drivers as cooperate, uh, cooperation frameworks, such as uh, the SDG or uh, 2030 agenda that allows to uh, uh, frame certain diplomatic or policy actions that could benefit from science diplomacy for addressing global challenge. In, in that uh, report, we provide a, a vision and a mission 
for the European Union to be accomplished and worked on. We think that the European Union should step forward and become a leader in multilateralism and in addressing global challenges via science diplomacy. And this is because the European Union is on the one hand, a unique political experiment in the world, since it combines integration, intergovernmentalism and multi-level governance all at once. At the same time, it's a global leader in science and technology with a wide and open to the world framework program, such as now the Horizon Europe program. So actions such as the EU Green Deal or the Recovery Fund for COVID-19 could be uh, actions to follow up on this to address global challenges such as climate change and uh, putting science on top of the uh, priority agenda of the European Union. In the report also we provide 15 policy recommend recommendations to achieve a systemic change. That systemic change, you've got it in the screen, is focused about five different areas, knowledge, governance with no silos, alliances, institutions, and people. In, in the matter of governance framework, which, which is the one that we are discussing now in this round table, it's important uh, that we highlight the three policy recommendations in the policy report. One is creating and strengthening hybrid institutions to bring science and diplomacy together. The second one is improving the EU integration and cooperation with uh, the neighborhood area and third countries through scientific research uh, frameworks on issues of shared challenges. For instance, how to uh, tackle climate change in the Mediterranean area, we, uh, involving the, both the north and south of the Mediterranean. And third, improve the coordination between the European Commission and the European External Action Service on global and multilateral challenges uh, with the use or the advice of scientific and technological uh, development. And this is somehow uh, being explored as we speak with the appointment of a science and technology advisor from the European Commission to the European External Action Service. So uh, take on message is that we need to break down communities and institutions that have been siloed for a long while or that have not spoken at an equal level uh, before. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think uh, the word silos is a nice bridge towards the next panel uh, that will be following us in a couple of minutes. But before I go to that, before we, we go to that and introduce uh, our fellow colleagues, um, I would like to ask a very short and quick questions uh, for the sake of actuality. But when it comes to governing science diplomacy with all those multiple stakeholders and levels and the very cl complex situation, what has COVID-19 taught us? Can you, yes. can you derive something from that? Yeah, um, I, I think, I mean, COVID-19 has shook up the geopolitical agendas on all levels. Um, as I already uh, said before, I mean, there, was, there are already so many transboundary uh, uh, mechanisms on all uh, policy levels from local to, to international, of course. Um, and this has only... Um, yeah, become more urgent. The 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 interactions that are being done are be only become more urgent urgent because of COVID nineteen, and I think it also sparked a reevaluation re of those mechanisms that are already in place. So, um, and for example, our governance framework could um, could support these these reevaluations re by asking, is the scientific expertise required in whatever activity you want to organize, really only from the natural sciences or the STEM sciences? Um, or how can we honestly trade off the various interests and values together? So not focusing on this national interest. And I think when it comes to um, societal challenges and COVID-19 has, has brought this to, uh, to light very strongly, we really need to keep our eyes on the prize. And I think in the end, this prize is tackling societal challenges and uh, tackling them is paramount. So we cannot, um, we cannot relapse into trench wars between diplomatic and scientific goals. There needs to be a combined goal. And although this risk of falling back into the old habits is very real, it is something we cannot afford. Um, so I think this, um, that COVID-19 has shown that a more cosmopolitan view and seeing all these global interactions between well, our globalized societies um, 
uh, is uh, uh, is that we're all in this together and it is not no longer an option but an, a requirement to have a cosmopolitan view on science diplomacy. Thank you very much, Thanks. dear Ivan. Thank you. Um, I think uh, what we talked about now, there's only a couple of minutes left for us, is um, a very nice display of, of thoughts and approaches towards the governance of science diplomacy and um, um, wrapping, it up, wrapping it up. I think there are a couple of buzzwords that we have to keep in mind when thinking about the governance of science diplomacy. One is the co-creation aspect and the alignment of interests and uh, a combined or common goal, I think, and also very much um, needed or, um, um, uh, yeah, very much needed is uh, a systemic or a systematic way to approach science diplomacy in order to align those interests and together. Um, I know we have a couple of questions uh, in mind. Uh, for the next panel, because um, there will be an hour where uh, our colleagues talk about um, how to not stay in their silos when uh, governing science diplomacy. And uh, we thought that it might be very interesting if you talked about how important it really is to govern science diplomacy at all. Of course, we try to solve this question now, but is it really important from a practitioner's side of view? Uh, or isn't it rather a domain that is characterized by self-organization very strongly? And the second question we thought might be very interesting is which governance related challenges in science diplomacy have all the panelists that will come together now um, faced in their work life already? We are very curious to hear about that. But before I, ha I hand over to my colleague Ida Skun, who will um, moderate the panel, I would like uh, Javier to uh, show us maybe his uh, graphic recording of our little session, because um, as some of you might already know, um, we have a graphic recorder, an artist who is uh, um, coming along with us during all those sessions. And this is how he visualized what we've been talking uh, about in the last 25 minutes. And thank you, Javier. This is very impressive and very nice. I can see the drivers and stoppers, the systemic change. Hello, and thank you very much. And uh, with these closing remarks, I would like to hand over to Eva Skun and thank Evert and Lorenzo for their uh, insights and uh, about for their words about the work they have been doing in the S4D4C project on the governance of science diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Lorenzo. And thank you, Evert. It was a very nice session. And let's follow on this conversation, very crucial conversation about governance of science diplomacy. Uh, my name is Itasku Lacunza. I work at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, and I am also partners at S4D4C. And Lorenzo explained very well which our contribution, main contributions have been to, to the project. I will be chairing this panel, Governing Science Diplomacy for Addressing Global Challenges, with three distinguished speakers that I will introduce in, in a minute. Before going into the session, I would like to encourage all the participants, which are over 120 already, to actually use the chat and the questions, because we really, we will really want to hear about your thoughts and impressions on the on the issue. We will devote some time after this session to um, bring some of the questions into to our panelists, both this session and also to the spotlight uh, colleagues. So please uh, be active in the chat and we will make sure to, to bring those questions to, to life. So we've been discussing for a while already that science diplomacy is basically a tool for achieving certain goals that can be national or uh, regional, for instance. But in S4D4C, we've been very interested in trying to analyze how science diplomacy can actually be a tool for addressing global challenges, which is, of course, a global effort and which is a huge of a task, actually. Uh, of course, for science diplomacy to become a key dimension of uh, international relations and a key dimension to, to try to address the, the very uh, important global challenges that we, we have at the moment, uh, many aspects need to be considered and discussed. Lorenzo was presenting already these spheres that we have identified. And I would say that governance is probably one of the most important ones, uh, probably in two ways. The very first one is how we somehow agree on a governance framework that is capable of somehow aligning science diplomacy objectives. 
but also, and even more important, how science diplomacy can actually contribute to the global governance of, uh, for addressing global challenges. So in order to discuss about the impact and needs of governance in achieving this, this vision, we have invited three uh, distinguished speak speakers that I am going to be presenting right now with vast experience in this uh, very fascinating interface of science, technology, and international relations. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Daria Robinson, Executive Director of the Science Diplomacy Forum at the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, Professor Sakri, Chairman of Atri Advisory, Pro Chancellor of Multimedia University in Malaysia, and also Chairman for the International Network of Go for Government Science Advice, also known as INSA, for the ASEAN region, and Ambassador Raut Bauer, which is the Austrian Tech Ambassador in Silicon Valley, Co-Director of Open Austria and Austrian Council in San, in San Francisco. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And colleagues, could you please introduce yourself briefly and also explain your current position and how it relates to science and technology diplomacy, please. Ms. Robinson, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Zaskuna, and thank you for the opportunity to be, to be here today. Um, so I am from Geneva, Switzerland, uh, born and raised in Geneva, a very the typical international Geneva background, and uh, studied astrophysics. So I'm, I'm a scientist by training, but very fast uh, understood that uh, my position was more on the bridge than in the labs. And um, so started in the early 90s with the European Space Agency, same, uh, same field Nadia, who we just heard is in, but in that field really trying to uh, help uh, bridge with the governments. And we started the external relations department, which believe it or not, didn't, didn't exist really. But that actually really showed that you need to uh, connect government, academia, industry, society, everybody, if you want to build uh, and use science uh, to its max. Um, then spent some time in the su sustainability world, I think really because we all have our calling and help the world be at a better place at a, at a certain time. And uh, landed at JESDA, uh, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator uh, in 2019, very shortly after it was created. Uh, it was created in 2019. Um, by the Swiss government. It's a foundation, it's a private uh, public foundation by the Swiss government, which is a rare occurrence and, and, a, and a sort of a, a test by the Swiss government as a strategic tool for the, by the foreign affairs department to see, well, how can we actually bring science diplomacy uh, to help multilateralism uh, and use Geneva and Switzerland uh, as, a, as, a, as a launching pad for an initiative like that, but really specify on anticipation. So. We'll have a look forward to, uh, to developing and, and, and explaining how, how we are going to attempt to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Very interesting. Uh, Professor Sakri, would you be so kind to introduce you a bit and explain us what your current position is? Okay. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm a student of science diplomacy by accident. By accident. 30 years ago, when I was a young professor at the National University of Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur, I was co-opted as a junior technical expert in the Malaysian government delegation negotiating the UN Biodiversity Treaty, or also known as the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. As you know, this treaty was one of three treaties to be signed at the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. I remember, Chair, at the end of the first day of negotiation at UNEP headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, I picked up enough courage to confront my head of delegation. Madam Ambassador, I told my leader, who was a seasoned diplomat, that I need to go home. And she asked me why. I told her that I couldn't fit the bill. All you do is meet in the plenary hall for an hour, and then you adjourn to the delegates lounge for two hours. The ambassador just nodded her head and smiled and told me in a kind tone, professor, why don't you give yourself another day? I soon found out that it was in the delegates lounge that the horse trading was conducted 
and deal struck by the battle weary deployment. That was 30 years ago. I never looked back. Besides the CBD, I represented my country in the early days of negotiation, uh, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. I was elected chairman of the CBD's subsidiary body on science. I was uh, also, I also co-chair the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. That was uh, a mega study uh, done by 1,000 scientists from 95 countries. I was recently elected as the founding chair of the Intergovernmental Platform on Science and Policy Advice on Biodiversity, uh, IPBES. And also I was a member of Ban Ki-moon Scientific Advisory uh, Board. Uh, and uh, that is, and uh, eventually I was also the science advisor to the prime minister. So chair, that is in quite a longish way explaining how I got into science diplomacy. But as I said, I never regret that day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sakri. You had a you have fascinating background. Um, Ambassador Rothbauer, uh, could you please follow and tell us a bit about your current position and background? Uh, sure. Um, well, first of all, a good morning because I'm uh, attending from uh, San Francisco, where it's uh, very early in the morning, and I'm uh, really happy to be part of this uh, very distinguished uh, panel and talk about uh, the subject of science diplomacy. Uh, what we, uh, as you can see in my background, call tech diplomacy uh, is a development uh, of recent years uh, in Silicon Valley, where a number of governments have appointed career diplomats uh, to deal uh, with uh, the global tech industry, with big tech companies, but also small companies, and establish a dialogue on an equal footing between nation states and tech companies. So I am a career diplomat myself. I was posted uh, to San Francisco and to Silicon Valley about five years ago uh, in order to open up a, an innovation outpost like many governments uh, have done uh, in order to um, help Austrian companies, Austrian also scientists and researchers to connect with the largest innovation ecosystem in the world. And the interesting thing is that my mission over time expanded and changed somewhat. Uh, and that has to do with uh, technology itself and how it is perceived by our citizens. If I think of the last uh, three years, uh, what they call in the United States, the tech lash or the backlash against technology has uh, taken root uh, also uh, in our uh, own uh, societies. Uh, we are in the midst of a revolution, the fourth industrial revolution uh, that is impacting not only our economies, but also our societies and the daily lives of our citizens. And it comes with a lot of opportunities, but it also comes with a lot of challenges. And these challenges uh, are uh, con increasingly concerning our citizens, um, as well as our governments. So the mandate of tech diplomacy really is to address these challenges that are in a sense, based on citizens' concerns, but are also based on groundbreaking breakthroughs, so to speak, in science that have made uh, technologies like artificial intelligence uh, possible uh, and their, their successes. So uh, what we are here uh, to do is uh, to establish a dialogue uh, with the stakeholders involved here. They include, of course, uh, entrepreneurs and tech companies, but they also uh, include um, researchers and scientists um, here in, in, in the U.S. West Coast, establish a dialogue with them and try to together shape um, technology that is a tool to address many of the global challenges that we are talking about today, but that are also, but technology is also a challenge in itself. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, really interesting. I mean, of course, the three of you have already um, pointed out about the direction of the of the panel, because of course, I mean, there's no need to say it sometimes, but when, when we talk about governance, it's not about governments only anymore. It's about being able to 
coordinate and, and somehow play in a field in which very many different stakeholders are um, interacting. So I would propose you three to take the glove from the previous panel and start with the few questions that they suggest for, for, for us to, to discuss. The first one is about governance itself. I mean, they, they want us to discuss whether even governance or coordination is needed or self somehow self-organization of science diplomacy and tech diplomacy should suffice. Do you think there is a need to discuss about governance of science diplomacy and tech diplomacy? And, and by the way, I'm going to be throwing the questions to, the, to you and anyone that wants to take the floor, just let me know and you're most welcome, of course. So who wants to start? I'll start the round again, I suppose, <laughs> as, as Martin and I have our mics open. Uh, yeah, I think I think what Everett said specifically on on the fact that you need to provide you know adapt the governance to now a much more multi stakeholder approach, and um, and also I think not just because of the stakeholders but also because of the topics. As Martin says, we're we're facing an amazingly exponentially developing world in science technology. We're, I mean, we're not being, we're not able to keep up with it <laughs> on if you look at where we are today. And so you need to adapt in many different ways and the more nimble we can create a way to work together and create a governance around that, the more successful we'll be. And the, and the big question is how, how do you actually create a flexible, adaptable model uh, that has to be global and inclusive and impactful. And, uh, and I think that's, that's really where where we need to all and we are all certainly um, paying attention and all we're all actually bringing a piece of the puzzle here i think thank you daria maybe martin or professor sacri okay i will i will uh, then uh, take the question here from a from a very um specific uh, perce uh, perspective and that that of course concerns the governance of technology if I, if I look at uh, the last decade where, of course, there was um, a boom um, in, 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 in Silicon Valley and, and around the world and a, a very um, optimistic attitude towards uh, new technologies, for example, um, the mantra here um, was that uh, those technologies uh, are kind of creating uh, new marketplaces, they are creating new realities. And governments, for example, should stay out of the governance of, of these new technologies. Uh, and they would, you know, because they otherwise they, they don't really understand these technologies. Um, they should um, uh, be left to themselves. And the mantra really in Silicon Valley was one of, of self-governance. This is markedly changed, not only because governments are increasingly uh, catching up uh, in terms of knowledge, um, but also in terms of the pressure, um, because we are increasingly see some, some of the adverse effects and the harms that some of these can, technologies can create, but also because uh, tech companies themselves realize uh, that they don't want to be left out there alone uh, once the problems start. So, um, and that is really uh, the framework uh, that has allowed um, for this kind of multi-stakeholder process that is taking place here uh, out there um, in, in, in Silicon Valley, where um, the tech companies are reaching out to us as well, and they're reaching out to civil society organizations uh, to sit together to look at the uh, challenges uh, that, uh, for example, uh, digital platforms uh, are creating for our societies, for our institutions, for our democracies, and talk about these issues together and uh, find and shape sometimes regulation, regulatory frameworks, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes self-regulation uh, of the companies uh, is the solution. Uh, and sometimes uh, we need to look at the processes, uh, how to involve uh, all the stakeholders uh, in order to get the full grasp of what the real problem is. Thank you, Martin. Well, for me, when you talk about when you talk about the governance of science diplomacy, uh, what you are really talking about is really how do you promote international collaboration? How do you promote dialogue? And for that to happen, you have to have a sort of a level playing field. So where do we start? 
to me, we should start uh, nationally. In any one country, the preference, the ideal one is to have the right infrastructure for science governance. You could start with the presence of a knowledge generator. For instance, the uh, National Academy of uh, Sciences, uh, they could be the resource group uh, to, uh, to provide scientific uh, advice to the relevant ministries, ministers, or senior government officials. Uh, that advice could also come from the universities and the public research institution, and also the, the uh, uh, business sector. Uh, at, the, at the apex of it, uh, we should also encourage the existence of science advisors in the relevant ministries, and preferably also there should be a chief science advisor to the president, to the prime minister. So you have that uh, hierarchy. Once you are done with that, then you can talk about uh, creating a network of uh, uh, collaboration in your science diplomacy. I'm not sure whether you have heard of this INSA, the body called the International Network for Government Science Advice founded by Sir Peter Gluckman, the former science advisor to the Prime Minister of New Zealand. I was part of that founding group. So INSA uh, provide that mechanism. Eventually, Chair, I think what we are doing in science diplomacy is to create and strengthen that interface between science and policy, the science policy network. And uh, that is very important to address those global challenges that uh, you referred to earlier. Thank you. Yeah, if I may, if I may build on on what Abdul is saying, uh, I think the you're absolutely right about about INSA and 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 the science officers or the. Uh, and we actually work very closely with uh, Peter Gluckman, who's uh, one of our, uh, I'd say, chief advisors, uh, moderators, as well as Marga Soler, who was with you yesterday. Um, I think the problem is that many countries don't have that mechanism in place and science is still brought in as a contributor, as an advisor, uh, and you know, as a, on the other side of the table. And then obviously uh, got the governments and decide what to do with it. And one of the things that we believe very strongly at JESDA is we need to bring the science community, not just the science content, but the science as a, as a thinking process also at the table in the decision-making. So how do you actually bring science rear at the core, like what, uh, what Abdu was saying, systematically on, on the bigger issues? Uh, so and, and in particular, as a new contributor to multilateralism, how can you help get a kickstart had a had a, a kick in the in in the, uh, to advance the program the, the way of doing things and solving things by bringing the science as a, as a piece in there and so that's definitely one of the that's why we absolutely start we look at science diplomacy from almost the other way around instead of looking at the problem then finding who can help solve it and then finding the technology to help solve the challenge we first look at the science and what's happening in the labs, a bit like Martin was saying, except we're looking at anticipation at 10, 25 years ahead. And then once we've identified what starts there, then we say, okay, well, what can that actually help solve? And then we get the people around. So the dynamics are very different. We're not following individual national agendas. You're actually first looking at what we can solve with what's going to be coming up including, as Martin says, the challenges brought on by technology, because that's a big part of the issue too. What advanced artificial intelligence or quantum or human augmentation comes along with a whole bunch of other very scary stuff that we need to deal with as we go. No, no, uh, can I uh, come in again? Sure. I absolutely uh, agree with you. Uh, you know, the scientific community cannot afford now to be just bystanders. They are a key player in this uh, configuration. Uh, there's, uh, of course, the scientists, the professors, they're interested in their research, publication, and getting uh, promotion as a professor or whatever. 
But there is another element, you know, their contribution to society, whether at the national or global level. And that uh, contribution has to be relevant, you know, and that relevance is really demanded now when you talk about solving uh, global challenges. Example, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has done a great job, right, to uh, articulate the issue of uh, 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 climate change uh, by the scientific uh, finding. But then again, uh, this configuration should also extend to how the scientists connect with the politician. IPCC again, they were not known until Vice President Al Gore picked up the fight for them. Uh, Al Gore championed climate change and uh, the rest was history. IPCC together with Gore received Nobel Peace Prize. So those are the kind of things we need to aspire to. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sakri. I think that there is certain agreement, agreement among the panel and also uh, from myself, of, of course, that science advice mechanism, mechanisms of all sort of uh, mechanisms, high level mechanisms to the prime ministers and ministries, but also other kinds of, of channels will certainly contribute to this governance of science diplomacy. Um, we've been talking quite a lot uh, in the conference already about the values of science diplomacy. And this becomes even more challenging when you talk about global governance in which very many different cultures and stakeholders may need to agree upon some certain values uh, so, so as to build on, on them. So what is your position about this? How should we achieve certain set of values uh, all together? Can we work on science diplomacy for addressing global challenges from different value, set of values? How, how would you um, think it's the best way forward? And how do we achieve that? Which is also the next question. Maybe I think that Martin wasn't uh, not in. Would you like to uh, uh, kick off, Martin? Sure, sure. Well, because... Um... I think this is a very important uh, question that you're that you're asking the question of values uh, and and this is uh, in, in reality um, one of the uh, key challenges that we have been facing here in, in our work is uh, to look at what these uh, changes that uh, the digital transformation um, is doing to our societies to our economies uh, to our daily lives uh, in reality, it is also kind of in, in some ways, particularly if you look at, at the po potential future applications of some of these uh, technologies like, like artificial intelligence, um, they're in reality, they're challenging um, also in, in what it means to be a human being. And, and uh, by blurring, for example, the border between um, human beings and, and, and machines. Um, uh, if you look at some of the advances in biotechnology, if you look at some of uh, the advance, advances in, in you know, in, in, in potentials of, of, of super intelligence. So um, we, what, what, what really um, is, is asked for uh, from, from our uh, political um, leaders is to uh, address the anxieties that uh, some of these potential uh, future developments um, uh, have caused uh, in our societies um, and to come up with um, a, a kind of concept or a framework that is based um, on a, a human-centered approach um, or on, on some, some sort of a kind of new uh, humanistic um, values that, that put again uh, human beings, uh, the autonomy, uh, of human beings again at the center of our approach. And this has concrete um, policy um, implications uh, in, in foreign policy, for example, because it means uh, that we uh, combine a very, very different aspect of uh, foreign policy, uh, but always driven by this uh, kind of humanistic, digital humanism is, is, is a word that, that we like to use in this context. Uh, approach, uh, whether we uh, apply it uh, to um, discussions about autonomous weapon systems um, and whether or not we should allow them and to what extent, because again, here the question is, um, the, uh, do we still want to have humans to be in control uh, of, of future warfare uh, or not? 
uh, or whether this um, a, a applies uh, to you know technologies of artificial intelligence. Uh, also in the geopolitical context, uh, when we look at the human rights uh, implications of, of these technologies. Um, and uh, when we say, okay, okay, you know, are we going to um, allow um, certain uh, surveillance uh, technologies uh, not to be used in, in a beneficial way, but in order to control and survey uh, our populations? So I, I think values are very, very important. They're important um, for our societies, but they are important because they are already impacted by the digital transformation. So we need to find responses. Um, we need to kind of, in a sense, look at our values, at our fundamental rights, affirm them, see how they're impacted and see how they might be impacted by future developments. Thanks, Martin. Daria, would you like to contribute? Yeah, I, I think the, the the term values is very difficult because it's it's a bit like ethics. It's 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 actually first of all it changes <laughs> from region to region, from culture, from religion, and and therefore what do you hang on to? You know, what value do are you going to consider the value? And so I think Martin put put the finger on it, and that's something that's actually quite fundamental to our work. There are three fundamental questions. And, and that basically puts everything. It's, it's, it's who are we as humans? What does it mean to be human in, in an age of robots and, and gene editing and augmented reality? And the second is how can we live together as a society? So what is technology, go, how is that going to impact us as a society and, or how will it impact positively or negatively? And then how are we gonna make sure as you know, we will live on a sustainable planet? And therefore, uh, with the world population, with the food and the energy we have. So in a way, all the values you know, are, are, are about how we can live as individuals, as a society, and, and take care of our planet. And that actually pretty much embraces uh, the challenges also that we face. How are we going to... Uh, and, and I think the other, probably the, the red thread through all that we can consider value for all is human rights. Again, as Martin said, I think human rights and, and, and we're lucky, you know, in Geneva, we're, we're, we're right in the middle of it. And one of our key uh, diplomacy moderator, as we call them, uh, is Michel Bachelet, so, who is the human rights commissioner. And so we definitely uh, believe that that's a thread that has to go through everything. And especially in a work like we do, um, to elaborate slightly, when we, we work on topics like quantum uh, advanced uh, artificial intelligence, human augmentation, eco regeneration, geoengineering. So these fields that are actually now brewing in the labs where we've actually assembled the best scientists in the world to tell us what's happening in those areas. Tell us how you see your work in 10 years. And, and some of them are actually five years, some of them are 10 years and some are even further. But, um, and then, when we portray that and say, what is that? And then how are you actually going to be able to bring that to the table of a policymaker or a diplomat or a business for that matter, or for the citizen? So the, the translation piece, and that's, that's the most difficult. I know, I know that's another question you have probably coming up, but the most, the most difficult is how you actually make it happen. You, it's not just by putting people together that things work. <laughs> Thank you, Daria. Professor Sakri? Yes, uh, I agree with Daria that values uh, can be quite varied depending on how you define it. Uh, I would think uh, one of the values that should be considered in a science diplomacy governance would be a universal recognition on the objectivity of science. But the world is bigger than that. We should also consider uh, recognizing the value of indigenous and local knowledge. As you know, in the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem, we, for the first time, recognize the value of indigenous knowledge, uh, indigenous and, and local knowledge. Secondly, I think one must recognize that uh, we, the scientists shouldn't be talking down to the policymakers, politicians, and others. So in other words, 
designs must be policy relevant and not policy prescriptive. So the scientists shouldn't be on a hilltop preaching what is right, what is wrong, you know. You can only provide in a neutral, objective way the advice which is relevant, but never, never uh, prescriptive. Uh, and finally, I think any uh, science uh, diplomacy uh, governance advice, that advice must be credible. So that means uh, credible knowledge arising from research or the study of the scientists must be re relevant and it must also be legitimate. Legitimacy means uh, the advice is requested, is requested by the political leaders or policymakers. Those are some of my comments on this aspect. May, may I just add one more uh, aspect uh, um, to, to, to what Abdul and, and Daria said, because they, they posed uh, correctly the question uh, how to, in, in some ways, uh, bring these uh, insights of science um, uh, to policymakers. Um, and also, and that was kind of the title uh, and, and the initial question of our panel, how to break up these different silos of policymakers, uh, scientists, technologists, um, and, and, and our citizens. And one approach that we have tried out here together with, with, our, uh, with other partners here is to look at art. Um, because artists, uh, in, in some ways, they shape um, in many ways. They also illustrate and um, uh, explain in, 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 in often very, very well uh, what, what, our, what the underlying values, um, uh, whether or not they're changing, are about. They also challenge these values in, in, in many ways. And when it comes, for example, uh, to climate change, when it comes to technology, um, artists um, often have very, very surprising um, views. They look at um, outcomes uh, that uh, even scientists or, or technologists have not thought about. So what we have done uh, here in Silicon Valley is work very, very closely with artists that reflect uh, on uh, technologies. We even brought them into the research and uh, science uh, lab laboratories uh, to work with technologies uh, on these uh, technologies of the future and possibly shape them. So really uh, looking at the values um, and looking uh, in, in what ways they in reality shape um, our future. I, I, I love that if I may, or, or you want to, you are, are you pressed on? <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you. I, I think that's absolutely a point that um, what art does and what artists do, there are two points there. One is that they actually talk to our emotions and they don't talk to our brains. And so you're actually gearing, you're getting people suddenly to switch in a different mindset. And a lot of the reason it's so difficult to work together and that we we are in our silos and and and, and is because your specialty is siloed, but how do you know how to break the silos when you need to break the silos? So I always say, you know, you cannot be a brilliant scientist if you're all over the place and you're not in your bubble. On the other hand, you need to be able to pull out so that the art actually really pulls us all into a sort of a common space because you get the emotion in there and, and you have other ways of doing that, you know, images and I, I know having spent a lot of time in the space field, well, space makes people dream and it's enough to have a space image behind you that suddenly you're floating. You know? But uh, the other thing is that art as other individuals can bring sort of the insolent mix in the, in the equation. And what makes the difference in my experience and, and what we're building uh, with our methodology at JESDA is you have to understand what spice to put in at what time so it triggers something that you're looking for. And, and the, whole, the whole complexity is indeed, if you're trying to do a mayonnaise, it's not the same that if you're trying to do a souffle, so you don't wanna put the wrong spice at the wrong time or the wrong ingredient at the wrong time. But the art or the philosopher or the science fiction writer or the youth, I mean, that's, a, that's an important piece. It's a different mindset too. And how do you compose with the mindsets and, uh, and, and create, uh, create something concrete in the end? 
Thank you, Daria. We, we actually had a session on arts and science this morning because we, we also have this uh, concept of yet there is another silo to break uh, there as well. Um, we are running out of time, but we, I really want to ask you two more questions before uh, we go into the questions from the audience. So I would ask you to be as brief as possible. Um, the first one is about, I mean, again, let me come back to the idea of governance being something else that governments talk into each other, but also incorporating uh, companies, citizens, as Martin has um, put a, a few times already, which is essential, and NGOs, etc. But it is also true that the science diplomacy discourse comes from the government side of things in, in a way. I mean, you have to, if you look at S44C partners, we are basically uh, either public researchers or public institutions. And I know that the three of you have worked quite a lot, a lot with companies. How is, is, are we very far away from their language? I mean, is it science diplomacy or tech diplomacy is in their agendas at all? And if not, how could we try to bring them into this joint endeavor, which is science diplomacy for addressing global challenges. I think, Daria, would you like to? Uh, I'll start, start, I have. Um, yes, the, I think again, it, for me, it's very much linked to the mindset and understanding what the ROI, what is the expectation of each of the players at the table. And um, so we've really worked on designing a methodology, we're calling it the, and to, the situation room, sort of a, a a pipeline on how you get things done. It's it's one thing to develop an idea. It's another thing to build something concrete out of it. We actually want to go from, okay, we need to figure out how we're going to deal with the future of quantum. Okay, well, what are you going to do concretely about it? So you need to put the scientists with the diplomacy actors to actually together align on, well, are we going to have the right technology to align to the right challenge? That's not trivial to start with. But then once you've identified and you've validated what it is that we should do, how are you going to do that? And that's when you have to bring in other players. You need to bring in those who will define the governance, who those, those will define the business model, the funding partners. And so all these different, uh, I'd say, stakeholders come into the equation at a different time. If you bring them in too early, you will have a, a biased development of how we're going to address global challenge. But if you don't bring them at all, you'll never get a sustainable solution that it can survive financially or politically. So you have to understand the role of each player and at what time that player has to go in. To be able to do that, you need to bring them at the table uh, all along, but at different doses. Again, it's really like a recipe and, and how, how you work with all of them. Um, maybe uh, just a, a, again a perspective here from Silicon Valley, where of course this is our main mission uh, to dialogue with uh, companies and the private sector. And um, I, I would say uh, th there's um, many things um, to be learned from this concrete experience. W one thing is, of course, we always have to be aware that uh, when we uh, talk to big tech companies that uh, they have um, different motivations to engage in this uh, dialogue than, than governments have. Um, tech companies uh, or any companies uh, are, are, have a business model and they're, they're driven um, in, in, to a large extent by um, profits and by um, you know, making money and, and they're also very open about it. But that's not the whole story. Um, there are a lot of uh, tech companies um, also that are driven by, you know, um, their, their own values uh, to different degrees. And, and a lot of it is also PR, yeah, quite, quite honestly. But, but in, in some cases, those company uh, values are important too, uh, not just as a public relations exercise, but also to attract talent. And, and this has been an issue um, uh, in, in Silicon Valley where uh, these companies want to attract the brightest and the best young people from around the world. And, and they have done so very successfully uh, over the last decade. And those people have, the, the, those people that work for them, they, they, they have, they're, they're um, driven by ideals uh, to make the world a better place. Um, uh, uh, and that go beyond uh, company slogans and, and PR. So uh, in a sense, um, there is also uh, pressure uh, within these companies um, to uh, you know, solve global challenges. And increasingly, um, 
these companies reach out to governments, reach out to multilateral organizations, uh, start have their own uh, programs, try to make use of their own technologies to solve uh, global challenges. And what we need to, you know, uh, do as government is to to sort out, in, you know, the the the, the PR from from the real um, intentions and the real motivations, uh, and and enter into a meaningful dialogue um, that that um, is is based on you know on knowledge uh, and and scientific facts, um, and and that can in some ways. Um, reap the, the energy and reap uh, the, 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 the good intentions um, of also companies uh, to solve global challenges. Thank you, Martin. Me, Professor Sacri, please. Yes, to me, this question is very simply answered. There is already an example, a successful one. If you recall, during the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg in 2002, there is already the major group, the nine major group, be, beside the science and technical community, we have business and industry, youth, farmers, who else, uh, indigenous people, local authorities, uh, women, workers, and trade union all have a role to play in the global governance. It's a very inclusive process. No one is left behind. Everyone is consulted. So why don't we just follow that? The nine major groups, I think, is still uh, functional now. And you can solve a lot of problems through that mechanism. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I still have a few questions to to go, but I, I've been to, I've been told that we have quite a number of questions from the audience. So I'd rather jump into the into that part of the session if you if you don't mind. So I'm going to introduce now to Ana Lorza, which is a colleague of mine. She's been taking a look at the questions and the chat, and she will be putting some questions to to you if you if you don't mind. And in the meanwhile, um, I think that we are going to be showing the work of our graphic designer because we. Uh, as we said, we believe in arts as well very much. Let's see how, how they are doing. And without further, wow, that's nice. So without further delay, I'm going to be um, uh, passing the floor to Ana Lorza, who will be, as I say, sharing some questions from the audience. I will be back after Ana because I would like you to ask for uh, some final statement to the, to the panel. So I don't say goodbye yet. See you in a while. Thank you, thank you Ithas Kun and thank you to the panelists. Uh, we had a lively chat and some questions for you. Uh, the first question was about the innovation houses and uh, how exciting it is. And uh, to Ambassador, uh, how would you engage in Silicon Valley um, be better characterized as, as innovation diplomacy rather than science diplomacy? Uh, if you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit more about this. Yes, um, well, innovation uh, outposts um, are abundant um, here in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, most countries have um, engaged in some sort of uh, presence uh, here. Um, that is due to the fact that um, countries, governments have very, very different um, agendas. One, one of them is, of course, to help um, one's own companies, one's own startups, one's own uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs um, to connect uh, with uh, investments, and and those are the, these, these typical uh, engagements of innovation houses. And and Open Austria uh, also engages. We have an uh, accelerator program. We uh, mentor startups um, from Austria uh, here in Silicon Valley, and most countries do that. Uh, also, we try to attract investment uh, from Silicon Valley um, to, um, to 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 Austria. So, so that, that is something most countries um, have done for quite a while. Um, what is new uh, is, and, and there I think tech diplomacy uh, in many ways is very similar to science diplomacy. What is new is that there is um, an increasing awareness of a global um, urgency. And since the tech industry is at the same time local, 
um, because the headquarters are in, often concentrated in, in certain areas. Um, at the same time, the issues are global and these uh, companies operate globally. So there is this increased um, awareness of governments that we need to uh, engage with them um, in, in, in a serious dialogue. Uh, and that goes beyond uh, what, what has been traditionally done through you know, lobbying efforts um, of company representatives in the centers of political influence um, in our capitals uh, or in Brussels with the European Commission or in Washington DC or in, in capitals around the world where these global platforms have you know, lawyers and, and lobbyists that try to influence uh, the policymaking process, but that we need to actually um, come here um, where these uh, technologies um, originate and uh, talk uh, to um, the, the companies about human rights, about legislation, yes, uh, but also about the underlying values and engage in a meaningful dialogue. And we do this increasingly together. So uh, Denmark was one, the first country in 2007 and appointed the tech ambassador uh, the European Union is thinking uh, of um, sending a, a, a tech envoy uh, to Silicon Valley. Um, the United Nations has, um, um, you know, in, in Secretary General, the uh, process of digital cooperation has uh, established an office um, a for, for a tech envoy. So there's, there's increasingly even multilateral organizations that are thinking of new ways uh, to engage uh, with uh, the private sector and these um, tech uh, innovation outposts have, in a sense, expanded their traditional role. And uh, if I may continue, uh, Martin, because we have also another question uh, uh, profounding on this. And where would you see the biggest structure lines, I mean, between the US, Europe and China, and how to find balance of uh, jointly working to make the digital transformation beneficial for all versus economic interests, et cetera? So very, very, very short, because I don't want to monopolize uh, the discussion, I would say um, the United States and Europe, uh, European Union, um, have by and large very similar values uh, when it comes uh, to our belief in democracy, when it comes to our belief in human rights. And this is important, where we sometimes differ uh, is uh, in how to regulate um, innovation, you know, sometimes we have maybe a little different, dif different interpretation of certain, um, you know, human rights, um, such as freedom of speech, which, which is give, given different weight uh, in, in, in uh, across the Atlantic, but overall, um, particularly uh, now, um, you know, in after the experience of a global pandemic, um, and uh, you know, this, there is, an, there is uh, an increasing awareness that Europe and the United States need to work together uh, to uh, confront uh, these global challenges such as uh, climate change uh, and such as also how to regulate well, for example, digital platforms. So this is, I would say, something where we want to work together. We might have sometimes different views. Uh, and with China, we need to work uh, together as well on, on these issues. But yes, sometimes there are... Uh, our differences uh, when it comes to human rights, uh, and and um, and and we we need to also address these differences. But there are also um, similarities, and and we and an awareness that uh, some of the global challenges we face, such as climate change, we can only uh, face uh, together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for clarification. Um, and then uh, the next question goes to Dr. Zakri. Uh, and uh, the question is, as chairing the IPDES, uh, what factors could you number that prevented a broader participation of scientists from the Global South? And how was the relationship of them with their missions at the UNEP? Professor Zakri. Well, yes, yes, thank you very much for that question. As you know, the Global South is always at a disadvantage we have this so-called knowledge deficit. So you would see in the platform, global platform like the IPBES, most of those uh, volunteers, those scientists tend to be from the uh, developed countries. Uh, we need to change that. Uh, we need to be uh, representative. So uh, what we do here, uh, like for instance, uh, uh, 
generating fellowship for young uh, scholars, scientists to be involved in the numerous assessment. Uh, the other one is to have uh, scientists learning on the job. Uh, so in, in some ways, uh, working uh, hand in hand with their colleagues from uh, the global north. Uh, we found there's a lot of camaraderie among the scientists in tackling uh, global uh, uh, challenges. So that is how we do it, you know. Uh, again, the issue is to be inclusive. The issue is to be diversified. And with that, I think uh, many of those uh, uh, obstacles can be overcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, then we have uh, another question. Um, the question is about the global commitment for digital cooperation, uh, as the UN was uh, claiming. Uh, considered to be a constructive framework for various stakeholders like governments, tech companies, scientists, diplomats, uh, and others to achieve the goal of governing, uh, governing global challenges. And this might be a question for all of the panelists. Maybe uh, Daria, if you want to come in here. Yeah, it's, it's a topic that we in, in Geneva are, are looking at, so not just the specifically per se, but uh, it, obviously, the, the question of digital governance is, is, uh, comes in a lot of the UN type conversations that we have uh, in Geneva. And um, I'd say so for, for us specifically, the governance question of digital is looking more at what is, um, uh, what is not happening, let's say, and, and especially what is the um, what are the future generation of uh, artificial intelligence and how will that perturb whatever decision we're making today? So typically in discussions with the ITU or other big leaders in the, in the sphere is, uh, okay, well, we're all focusing on today and, and helping the, the system, today's system work, but how long will it actually be like today? And in five years, whatever solution we're discussing today might be completely obsolete. So there's that, there's that, factor to also not forget and we're we're trying to focus on that piece in particular but indeed uh, that's definitely a hot topic in every conversation we have uh, whether it's the UNHCR or the uh, or, or the of course the WIPO the WTO uh, where we work with all the director generals of these organizations and that's definitely the one thing on their agenda when they think technology and when they say well what do you what's highest on your agenda uh, artificial intelligence and, and how to deal in the, with the digital and data is the is the topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daria. Uh, Martin, would you like to add something here? Well, I, th I think I think that Daria addressed it. Um, I think it, the 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 UN framework is is um, pr probably has its it, its flaws, but I think it is it is it is the only. Um, system that we have to address and to address these global challenges and um, I think that um, you know some some of the the, the challenges uh, that the United Nations addresses like uh, the the gap uh, uh, to uh, of the global south when it comes for example uh, to access uh, uh, two technologies. Um, the UN is really the the, the only uh, mechanism that addresses these challenges. And uh, e even here in Silicon Valley, where many of the countries of the global south are not represented, um, we are trying uh, in cooperation uh, with the United Nations office uh, to address this challenge uh, and to include them um, and uh, to um, you know include them in this emerging. Um, uh, tech diplomacy uh, efforts of countries uh, that that are, of course, uh, you know, um, this is all, access to technology um, is in some ways when we think of technologies like artificial intelligence is also about power in in, in some ways and it, therefore um, it is there is a competitive uh, nature in this thing, but I think that the United Nations is the one uh, governance uh, structure that is uh, addressing uh, these uh, global imbalances and in inequalities, and, and we need it, and we need to uh, work very closely within this framework uh, to address these these gaps. 
Thank you. I'm afraid that, that we have no more time. Yes? No, I just want to support what Martin has just expressed. This is about accessibility, about the imbalance uh, globally. Uh, you don't even have to talk globally, but even in the national setting, this access to the internet is a very real problem. Today, uh, Chair, you see with the COVID-19, there's a tendency to uh, make students stay at home and uh, do it online. But in some countries, there are rural folk who don't even have access to the internet. So when Martin said that the UN is addressing that, I'm fully supportive of such uh, sympathy, you know, from the uh, uh, advanced countries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor. So Itaskun, if you want to come back and yes. maybe wrap up everything. Yes, thank you, Anna. And thank you to the panelists. It's, it's been a fantastic session. Um, we are going to be sharing the art again so that the, uh, the participants can see it. Of course, we will share it at some point at the end of the conference and in our social media for anyone to, to use. Um, and before closing the session, I would like to ask our panelists whether they want to say a very last sentence on the topic or something for the audience to reflect upon. Um, that would be very nice if you, if you want. Daria, would you like to say something to wrap up? Yeah, I, I think probably what, what we see the most today in, in, this, in, very, in the very young Jezda, um, having brought the scientists uh, who have the concern of, of, of helping the planet and humanity be a better place and bringing in our top diplomacy leaders at the table together, what comes out as the most, I'd say, missing piece is indeed around governance. How do you actually create the right framework to enable the future of a technology? How do you create the right framework to disable? Do we have to restrict? Do we have to create an arbitration court of science? Do we have to create a new laboratory to allow access for AI? So it's really the, the when you put the, the science and the diplomacy actors together at this stage, the, what is most striking is indeed that it's, yes, there are ideas of let's build a new research knowledge institution to help you know, uh, uh, develop a, a better curriculum and, and different aspects, but it's uh, how are we gonna build trust and how are we gonna build a stronger uh, society and, and tools for the future uh, by bringing the actors together, and uh, and I think I think we've got we've got some today. We have a great, I'd say, just your conference and all the actors we've been hearing today, and and in your whole week, uh, we have a, an amazing ecosystem to make it all nicely coordinated, and each of us hold a piece of the puzzle. And uh, now we need to <laughs> align everything and put it all on a national, on a multilateral, and you know I think it's 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 wonderful to see how. Uh, how we can uh, how we can build a better future with uh, with uh, with this. Thank you, Daria, so much, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, maybe Martin. Well, thank you. I I also wanted to thank uh, you for organizing and convening this panel. I've I've learned a, a lot from from the other panelists' uh, contributions and from the very uh, inspiring questions. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, thinking is, you know, science diplomacy. Um, tech diplomacy, innovation diplomacy, they are in a sense labels that help us and help um, our policymakers focus, you know, on various aspects in reality of the same uh, issues. And th those are those global uh, challenges uh, that in, in some ways we need to tackle together as countries, as governments, uh, together with our citizens. Um, and uh, these various, you know, aspects um, help us um, uh, gain uh, or in some cases regain um, what is sometimes lacking and which is trust and uh, it's also what da Daria mentioned I, I fully agree we need to in some ways find mechanisms um, of governance a mechanism of inclusions that help us regain uh, the trust of our citizens uh, into um, the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you Martin and finally Professor, Sa Professor Sakri. You're muted, I believe. Yes, uh, science diplomacy is a 
kind of a new term. I think it was introduced in 2010 when that booklet, uh, Science Diplomacy, was released by the Royal Society and the AAAS. But Science Diplomacy has already been operating for quite a while. And throughout its history, it has shown its uh, utility, its constructive ways of solving uh, problems. So, so uh, when we talk about finding the right governance for science diplomacy, I think is a very right uh, approach. And I would urge the scientists to be a, a key part of that equation because we have a lot to contribute to turn this world into a prosperous and peaceful one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, thank you so much to all of you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we are just on time. I am very happy to, to have achieved that um, goal. And the conference goes on. So to our participants, let me remind you that we will start in half an hour. We have a half an hour break and we will start back at four with three parallel sessions. And then at, I think it's at 5.45 that we will be meeting you in the social hour. It is a pity that we are not going to be able to gather in a physical conference, but we really want to get to know the, our participants and we will join in the cocktail session. So thank you very much to the panelists and to the audience and let's uh, we see each other in the next session. Bye, thank you so much. <laughs>